uh, was swift and pretty universal in our press corps. Uh, we saw condemnation, uh, not just from the White House Correspondents Association, which of course represents all of us, but from uh, many individual journalists and news outlets, including the uh, president of Fox News. Um, and I think the kind of uh, speed and uniformity with which we saw these reactions sends exactly the message uh, that the press corps feels, which is this was a very ordinary performance from a reporter in a pool spray. This is the sort of thing that's happened for decades. Reporters are in there because the president wants a press moment. Uh, they ask questions, and it's up to the president to answer them or not to answer them. So uh, I hope that that sent uh, a very a clear message uh, of, of uniformity, but, uh, but that it was certainly, um, uh, certainly, you know, crossed the line in terms of normal White House reaction to, uh, to normal press interaction. Yeah, this was an ordinary press moment. Reporters ask questions, and I bet they continue to ask questions. Michael, not ordinary at all. Members of the Freedom Caucus, Republicans in the House of Representatives, now introducing articles of impeachment for Rod Rosenstein, the Deputy Attorney General. Anything to this? Will this go anywhere? What do you see here? It, it's politics, and it's the circus is in town. This is not going anywhere. Substantively, they would never get the votes that they need in the House. Even Trey Gowdy is against the impeachment process. So this is really about theater, and that's unfortunate because you really don't want to make a theatrical production out of national security issues, which is what's at the heart of what they're asking for, which is more documentation around the email investigation of Hillary Clinton and the FISA warrant of Carter Page. They've received tens of thousands of documents, and this is really just a sideshow, and it's unfortunate. Margaret, I mean, the irony is that they, the House uh, Intel Committee, has had access to hundreds of thousands of yes. documents. They can go and view them. In other words, the Department of Justice has opened the files in a, a, an almost unprecedented, possibly truly unprecedented way to comply, to try to comply with what the Republicans have wanted to see, even though there's an ongoing investigation. And so now they don't want Rod Rosenstein? I mean, now they want to punish Rod Rosenstein? Yeah, and, and you've seen a few dozen lawmakers take advantage of that, a couple of key ones not take advantage of it. But Rod Rosenstein has had, one of, since he came on, one of the most uh, difficult uh, jobs in the U.S. government in terms of uh, defending the American people in a law enforcement posture while sort of trying to fend off uh, a lot of the political pressure that's coming from both the White House and, and, and some of the president's top defenders in Congress. And he's in this unwieldy position of uh, really by, uh, by tradition and, and by job not being able to get out there and publicly defend himself politically. I mean, he occasionally has, uh, but it's really not his job and he hasn't viewed his job that way. So he just sort of keeps plugging along. But I think what you're seeing here is kind of a new ratcheting up of the political pressure against Rosenstein creates potentially some kind of space if the president decided uh, that he wanted to try mm -hmm. to do something against Rosenstein, gives him a, you know, a little bit of political support for it. I still think it would be a tremendously uh, controversial move. And the way that they did this uh, the procedurally, without getting into the weeds, the timing of the way uh, yeah. that these lawmakers pulled this move essentially ensured that there wouldn't be any action ahead of the recess, and probably not in September, but allows them to make that statement and give that uh, it's a show. political it, boost to the president. It, it, it's just a show. And Margaret, you're standing outside the White House right now. Where's the soccer ball? Where's the soccer <laughs> ball? Vladimir Putin gave Donald Trump a soccer ball. You're part of a Bloomberg team which has done fascinating reporting on what is in that ball. It is. Well, this is to some extent the, uh, the yeah, that's right, it is to some extent the kind of, we're all experienced this with Alexa or some of the modern innovations in uh, internet technology, but this is a soccer ball that by manufacturer, by design, off the, off the you know, uh, manufacturer line from Adidas has a chip embedded in it <laughs> that in theory would allow just a regular user to uh, watch video of players or figure out whether their left foot kicks harder than their right foot. Um, so the big question, of course, is, is that the way it was delivered to the president um, from, uh, from Vladimir Putin? Uh, was it modified in any way? Was there ever a chip in it? If you bought it retail, there would be a chip. We're not getting answers to any of those questions, but uh, the White House Secretary, Press Secretary Sarah Sanders uh, telling us yesterday, quite decisively, this ball has already been through the typical screening procedures that any potential gift uh, to the White House 
uh, would. We think it's highly unlikely it's anywhere near the backyard soccer goals. Oh, my gosh. Right. First of all, why does any soccer ball need a transmitter chip? Okay, I mean, let's just go back. Can we just be old school and just kick the thing around? <laughs> no. Do we need to watch a movie on it? It's, it's um, 2018. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, well, Margaret, great reporting. Thank you, Michael Zeldin. Thank, thank you, you very much for the analysis. We saw in that, in that picture Secretary of State Mike Pompeo eyeing the soccer ball with suspicion. Good. As the been, former CIA director. Obviously. That was last week. Yesterday, he was up on Capitol Hill being grilled by U.S. senators from the Republican and Democratic Party. One of those senators who asked these questions with us next. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo faced senators on Capitol Hill and spent much of the time defending the president's meeting with Vladimir Putin. President Trump believes that two great nuclear powers should not have a contentious relationship. He strongly believes that now is the time for direct communication. Presidents are entitled to have private meetings. What matters is what President Trump has directed us to do following his meeting with Vladimir Putin. You somehow disconnect the administration's activities from the president's actions. They're, they're, they're the one and the same. This is President Trump's administration. Make no mistake who's fully in charge of this yeah. and who is directing each of these activities that has caused Vladimir Putin to be in a very difficult place today. Yeah. Joining us now is Democratic Senator Jeff Merkley of Oregon, who did question the secretary during that hearing. Senator, thank you so much for being with us. We don't know what happened behind closed doors between President Putin and President Trump. There was no one inside the room besides interpreters. You had a chance to ask the secretary about this extensively yesterday. Do you have any better sense as to what was agreed to? No, absolutely not. And I'm not sure if Secretary Pompeo even knows. He only knows what the president told him. He obviously was doing a good job of playing his role as secretary, defending the president. Uh, but really what he did was spend uh, three hours yesterday playing dodgeball. One of the things he suggested, and we have heard this before, is that look at the actions from this administration. You're all paying too much attention to what the president of the United States says. But Yesterday, the government put out a statement saying it does not recognize the Russian occupation of Crimea. That is a big, fast, hard action right there. The White House, the government has sanctioned Russia for election interference. The government has expelled Russian diplomats and Russian visitors to the United States. So the secretary says, look at the actions, not at the words. Is that a compelling argument? No, it sure isn't. When it takes a year and a half for the president to say that they don't recognize the annexation of Crimea, when <laughs> folks on Capitol Hill on both sides of the aisle have been saying uh, take clear action on this, uh, be fierce in regard to the occupation of eastern Ukraine, be fierce in terms of Russia attacking people within Britain, of Russia supporting the Syrian government, barrel bombing and gassing its own people, and certainly be fierce in terms of Russia launching a cyber attack against the United States and its election. And we haven't seen a fierce president at all. And so that's been deeply disturbing. One of the things that also did happen yesterday, again, if you're looking for action, is that the administration delayed this second summit with Vladimir Putin. The president invited Vladimir Putin to come to the United States in the fall. Vladimir Putin didn't answer, didn't give an answer, which is sort of superpower, passive aggressive. But now the White House National Security Advisor John Bolton puts out a statement saying the president believes that the next bilateral meeting with President Putin should take place after the Russia witch hunt is over. So we've agreed that it will be after the first of the year. Leave aside the witch hunt's politics there for a second. But are you encouraged that this meeting has at least been delayed? Well, I do think it was the right thing to postpone such a meeting. And for one thing, before there's another meeting, the United States should have a plan. Uh, Putin mm -hmm. had a very clear plan going into that summit. Uh, and the, unfortunately, President Trump uh, didn't. And it just looked like President Trump was being completely manipulated uh, by the Russians, which it seems that, that he was. So best to put it off. You had an exchange with the secretary about North Korea. And if I heard it correctly over the course of the hearing, I believe for the first time the secretary confirmed out loud that North Korea is still producing fissile material, still engaged in its nuclear program. What's your take on that? That's right. Uh, he did uh, declare that. Uh, he said he wouldn't answer about other advances in their program, whether those had ended or, or not. Uh, but what became very clear was that he was confirming that there is not yet any sort of agreement in terms of getting an inventory of their materials, their ballistic missiles, their warheads, not yet a plan for uh, how those things might be reduced, not yet a plan for verification. In other words, all we have so far is all sizzle, no steak. Well, you, you do have a meeting. You do have a pause in missile testing, at least. The, you know, Kim Jong-un hasn't fired any rockets in a while. 
he doesn't seem to have the same aggressive posture he had for a while. So there is that development, correct? Yes, but that is identical to what North Korea has done. That's mm -hmm. their game. They have done that with each of our presidents in the past. They lay off for a while, wait until the heat's off, and then they quietly or secretly continue their program. You've been deeply involved with the border situation in the United States and the Trump administration decision to separate parents from their children when they cross the border. Obviously, they've gone back on that decision now, and they're in the process of reuniting these families. The deadline is today. Let me put some numbers up on the screen so people can see where we are right now. The status of family separations, more than 2,500 uh, 2, parents separated from children. More than 1,000 have been reunited by the government. 463 parents are believed no longer to be in the United States. 